Um, I'm Brian. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. And I'm grateful and to be alive and sober. My sobriety date is July 2nd, 1995. Um, there were people in Maine that were betting that I would, wouldn't make it through the first year, right? much less this far. And I only have my higher power and you people to thank for that because it's the person that I am that walked through these do doors would definitely drink again. I'm nervous. I don't know why. Usually I ain't, I'm always a little nervous when I speak, and uh, but I'm really nervous tonight for some reason. And it's a special thing. I mean, it's a privilege and an honor to be asked, and for somebody to ask you on, on their um, sobriety date is that's something else. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of taken aback, and I had, a lot of, I had too much time to think about it. I'd rather somebody just not show up and say, hey, Brian, you want to speak? Yeah, go for it. Um, all right, what happened, what it was like, and what it's like now. Um, I was born in New York, as he said, um, in the Bronx. Um, I had Italian family, um, but I was adopted. Um, that was my first big beef on my shoulders. My mother told me I was adopted when I was seven, and she'll always tell everybody, I don't know what happened. He was a nice kid till he was seven, then he, he turned rotten. <laughs> and that ain't why I'm an alcoholic, but it can be why I'm an asshole sometimes. <laughs> Um, I felt different, you know, I mean, it's like everything I believed up till seven wasn't true. So, you know, and, and I mean, I had a couple of, you know, I thought very justifiable resentments. Number one, why couldn't the people who adopted me be at least millionaires? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 and most of that, who could have ever given up a prize package like myself? <laughs> I mean, come on. But anyway, um, I did. It, it caused a lot of pain and I just, I kind of withdrew into myself that um, when I was eight years old, we moved to Long Island. And where I went to school in the Bronx, it wasn't a nice school. Um, I was picked on physically till, I, till my father forced me to learn how to fight. And um, I still got picked on, but I at least had the satisfaction of fighting back. But when I moved to Long Island, it was a diff I was different. I mean, I talked different. Um, it was an affluent neighborhood, even though we weren't affluent, uh, where I went to school. And like these kids, like, you know, they were dressed up in what would be the equivalent of designer clothes today. And, you know, they'd be like, why are you wearing that? It's like, because my mother says either you wear that or you go to school naked. <laughs> and pretty much how it was, you know. I mean, we weren't dirt poor, but we weren't, certainly weren't rich. And I preferred getting my ass beat to being teased and, and picked on. Um, anyway, I didn't have a very... School was always rough. I did good in the subjects I liked. Report cards always come. He's a good student, but he doesn't really get along with others. And I didn't. I was sullen and withdrawn, belligerent. All these words were used to describe me. Um, and I was. I, I mean, I hated the world. I, I just felt I, I had an alcoholic disease of non-acceptance from a young child. I couldn't accept the fact that I was adopted. I couldn't accept the fact that my parents didn't have his as much money as everybody else. I couldn't, expe I couldn't accept anything. My dog got run over when I was, we first moved there. I couldn't accept that. I mean, I just couldn't accept nothing. Um, I, didn't want to, I, wanted, I wanted things the way I wanted them to be. Um, I remember seeing this movie. I mean, my, most of you probably have seen it. It's called The Departed. And it's about um, the Irish mob, which I think, I mean, the whole mob should be Italian in my book. But. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, the guy goes, Jack Nicholson goes to the beginning, I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. And I said, man, we park our cars in the same garage here. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know exactly how that is. I don't want things to be the way they are. I want them to be the way I want them to be. Um, at least I did. I mean, I still want things to be the way I want them to be, but I've learned to accept things not going my way a lot better. And that's through being here. Anyway... I always hate it when somebody's going through their story and it, they got eaten up a half hour and they ain't even started drinking yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, about 13 or 14, um, I was almost a straight A student until about this time I played some sports. At about 15, I guess it was, I'm, I, I discovered alcohol, 
drugs and girls all at the same time. <laughs> I remember in geometry, I had like the first two marking periods, I had like a 95 average and the, the, the test, they used big test at the end of the year, they called the Regents, I got like a, like a, a 25 or something. <laughs> My mother's like, how could you get a 25? She goes, they give you like 20 points for writing your name. <laughs> I say, oh, I guess I didn't write, forgot to write my name or something. But anyway, um, you know, things just, I found something that made me, didn't make me accept anything any better, but it made me forget about it. Um, and I mean, right from the get-go, alcohol and drugs were problems. Um, I mean, I wasn't 16 years old and I already had my first overdose. And it was like, and they, and they had the nerve to lock me in a loony bin. I uh, drank like a, like a quarter Southern Comfort and swallowed a bunch of Valiums, I don't know how much. And the doctor was like, he goes, why were you trying to commit suicide? So I was just trying to catch a buzz and kind of lost count of the pills. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is important that they put me in this place. It was at a hospital, Nassau Hospital. And I mean, things just, by the time I was 17, I was home, I, I mean, when you're 17, you can't lose that much stuff, but I lost everything you could possibly lose. I mean, I was sleeping in friends' cars and people's garages while the rest of the, you know, my classes, um, you know, deciding what they're gonna wear to the prom. I had this trick, I'd go sleep in train stations and they had these like heaters that had a thermostat with a little sensor on it. And if you put like a snowball or a bag of ice on it, it would run all night. I thought this was real clever. <laughs> um, but anyway, but I mean, deep down inside, I know this is not the way everybody else is living. Well, it was the, the people that I hung around with, that's how they were living. They were getting thrown in jail already before they even graduated high school. And I was heading that way. Um, anyway, I had a big altercation with my parents and the police, and I got thrown out like in the coldest winter at my house. I had no place to go, and people wouldn't even let me stay in their garages anymore. And the cops were smart to the train station thing. I was just getting kicked out of every place and I got the living shit beat out of me by the town cops. And um, I remember this nut house I was in. I said, at least it was warm in there and they had food. Um, but anyway, I went, I went to the emergency there, room there and for some reason the truth spoke out, fell out of my mouth. I said, I'm all effed up on alcohol and drugs and I need help. And um, they sent me to this place in Amityville called South Oaks Hospital. And when they were evaluating me, they would talk to me for about two minutes and threw me in the nut house and put, threw, put me on the lock and key. They said, you're a danger to yourself and everybody else. What did they say? I was a sociopath with an um, explosive personality disorder, which meant I knew right and wrong but didn't care, and I got mad real easy. And I still do. If I don't watch myself, I go from happy, joyous, and free to like, murderous mad just I, I skip all the steps in between I don't know what it is um, so I got to catch myself right when I'm leaving happy joyous and free and I usually do um, anyway uh, after about three months in the in the Casa del Wacos there they put me in the um, drug rehab which was run like the Marines it was called Hope House they called them therapeutic communities back then um, every little thing you did, they hung signs on you. It was crazy shit. If you, <laughs> I mean, it was. I mean, I, I don't see. I mean, if they, um, if you, if they had three cardinal rules, you couldn't get high, you couldn't have sex with anybody else in there, and you couldn't run away. And if you did one of them things, they shaved your head. And I don't think my hair ever got much longer than this. <laughs> and. I was on the verge of getting kicked out of, the, out of there and um, standing trial for like 52 felony counts of forgery and among other things. And I remember the, the lawyer was saying that my parents actually sprung for a lawyer. Um, and he said, he said, you know, he goes, you're going to go to jail for at least 7 to 15 years if you're convicted. He goes, you can't get kicked out of this place. And I was like, wow, it's something that's kind of, kind of restrictive. Well, anyway, some guy from the alcohol rehab his name was Bob Cahill come to see me. And he says, you're not doing too good in the therapeutic community because we're a little bit more lax over here. You might like it better. You might, are you, do you think you're an alcoholic? I said, I don't know. I said, I like to drink. And he said, if you could have any drug you wanted, including alcohol, what would it be? And I said, alcohol, man, you'd get that shit anywhere. I mean, he's like, you know, drugs, you know how it is. I mean, I'm not supposed to talk about this, but it is part of my story. You got called this one, that one, you know, wait on a street corner, alcohol. 
I mean, back then I couldn't even buy it legally, but I mean, it was back then if you had the money, most places just sell it to you, anything like it is now. Um, so anyway, I went to the alcohol rehab and um, I did well there. I mean, it wasn't restrictive. Um, it was co-ed. They didn't. They didn't enforce the physical contact thing. I mean, I was. I, if they wouldn't have asked me, if they wouldn't have graduated me, I'd still be there. <laughs> and I loved it there. I mean, it was easy. I mean, all you had to do was make your bed in the morning, go to group therapy, and go to an AA meeting at night. They fed you, clothed you. There was women there. I mean, what more could you want? <laughs> but they made me leave. Insurance ran out. And I, you know, I was. I was so fried, I didn't even think of the consequences of leaving. And you know, I did have the, the wherewithal to call AA, and they sent some girl over there to pick me up, and uh, I don't know who 13 step who, but we wound up in a relationship. Here I am, like two days out of rehab. And that didn't work out, because for the longest time, I didn't do relationships too good. Um, anyway, really wasn't interested, to be honest with you. but. Um, I stayed sober for a while. So I had a few slip-ups. I remember I got my hair cut by this girl, and she, we went out on a date that night, and she passed me a joint. And I mean, I didn't think nothing of it. I'm supposed to be staying sober, and I smoked it. And then I was like, well, I did this. I might as well get drunk, too. You know. Anyway, um, for some reason, I don't know what happened, but I just decided I wasn't going to drink any. I was going to really give this a try. Because I was kind of scared of going back to the life that, that I had been living. Um, and this time, I met my first wife, um, we had a whirlwind romance, got married a year later, and um, not long after we were married, her and my stepdaughter were killed, not far, right in front of me. Um, and, but that's not why I'm an alcoholic. If I'm honest with myself, chances are I drank that relationship away. You know, there's no human being, I believe that there's no human being that can keep another human being sober. Um, they could help you. But you can't, ain't no one's going to keep you sober. Um, anyway, after that, I was obviously not real happy. Um, I remember I was just sulked in my room for about a month. Because I, was, I, was, I, was, I was paralyzed with grief and fear. And just one day I woke up mad at the world, and that was a relief. I said, I know this feeling. I can live with this feeling. I've been mad at the world my whole life, so... Um, it beats having a broken heart anyway, and I started drinking again. I was going to stay sober in her honor, and that lasted maybe three weeks a month. Um, at this time, I also became a commercial fisherman. Um, it was a good job to have if you were drunk. You make tons of money. It keeps you off land for a while, so you stay... It's very ironic that the most dangerous job on the planet probably kept me alive. <laughs> Because I don't think I would have survived my drinking just staying on land all the time. I didn't, we didn't drink on the boat, but we, we, did, we did dry goods to make it through. Um, anyway, uh, I met my second wife during this time, and she was just basically a drinking buddy. And this is how I operate. I just flew by the seat of my pants to, you know, this, during this part of my life. She was like, when are we going to get married? And I was like, well, you plan the wedding, you plan the honeymoon, tell me where it is and I'll be there. I thought she, she was always too stoned to have a freaking follow through with it. <laughs> but she did. I remember in the limo with my godfather was my best man. I was like, I don't want to marry this. I, I ain't going to say what I was going to say. I don't want to marry her. And he's like, you can't freaking, you can't back out now. I said, why not? He says, because he goes, you'll break the poor girl's heart. I was like, I really don't think so. <laughs> but he talked me into it. He goes, give it a try. You can always get divorced. So I'm like, that's a real... <laughs> and I mean, this is how I thought back then. I mean, when I remember when I was in rehab uh, and sober, I was like, <clears throat> I was like, this is going to be a long life with no buzz at all. So, so I rationalized that the drugs were all the problem. And if I just drank, I could probably make it to 50 or 60. So that was my, my plan in life at 19 years old, was to drink myself back to AA in another 40 years. <laughs> I mean, it's really what, I mean, I, that's how I think of it now, but back then I thought that was a pretty good idea. I mean, you get away with a lot of drinking. You know what, but boy, once I started using that as my, own, my drug of choice, that was getting me in more trouble than the drugs ever thought of. Because I always had a vol volatile temper, and I had a lot of unresolved grief and angst. My father died during this period, too, and I took that real personal. 
Um, I took everything personal. That was my problem. Um, you know, the things that I had, I took blame and took personal for the things that are out of my control and blamed the things that were in control on everybody else, God included. Um, anyway, I lost my train of thought. That's a train that gets very easily derailed these days. But, um, I mean, I just went through life like that. I mean, just whatever the commercial fishing was good. I, I, I was very successful at it um, for a while. And then it was like, I did this really crazy thing. They put this, this um, tracking device on one of the boats I was captain of. And it was so the boat owner knew where it was. And he could, they, the, the company owned like three or four boats. So he could send them there because I'd never tell him where I was fishing. Um, and all of a sudden, the whole fleet was fishing with me all the time. So I unbolted the thing and threw it overboard. <laughs> Didn't care it was worth $50,000. <laughs> Boat owners call me like crazy. Where the fuck? I'm like, excuse me. Where are you? What are you doing? And um, I said, he said, where's the track? And it's not picking up a signal. I said, that's because it's it's about friggin' 600 feet down. He said, he says, you bring that boat in, you're fired. Um, I couldn't understand why he was firing me. I really didn't. <laughs> that was one of the first incident. The second incident, we got so drunk in Gloucester one time, we took the wrong boat out. <laughs> <laughs> this is my girlfriend's favorite part of my story. I, and again, I was like, the boat owner was down there yelling and screaming as usual, you're fired. I said, fired? I said, I, said, I took it back. I said, and the only reason I, I would have probably been still on it, but the only reason I took it back is I got in my bunk and there was a picture of somebody else's wife in it. And just at the point, there was a picture of anybody's wife in the thing. I knew something was wrong. I never, it wasn't sentimental like that. Um, actually, I am deep down in my heart, and I am now, but I, I would never show it back then. Anyway, I mean, it, I went from being one of the best captains to a deckhand again. And the worst thing you could be on a fishing boat is being a deckhand after you were captain, because basically you're training the guy who's your boss. Um, I had a big resentment over that. Um, things just, I mean, it was just one horror show after another. Every time the boat was in, I was lucky if I could drink towards the end of my drink in two days without getting thrown in jail. Um, and for some reason, it always let me out because I was, I was very good at manufacturing those crocodile tears in court and acting just as meek as a lamb. It's like, this can't be the same guy. He's polite, he's, you know. But I, it's just working. It's, plus, all the cops, all the judges I get a hold, I gave them lobsters, scallops. <laughs> um, anyway, I came in, we got in big trouble in Gloucester. I borrowed like $2,000 from this loan, loan shark called Cigar Smoking George. And if you got on the wrong side of Cigar Smoking George, he was the head boat unloader. And these guys that boat unload the, loaded the boats were very big and very strong. And he, he would get a few of them to tune you up pretty good. And, um, Got back to my wife. She had her bags packed, and um, I don't just at the placator. I said, you know, remember I said I used to go to AA. I'm gonna try it again. <laughs> so I went to a meeting in Canaan, Maine, which is like the middle of. I mean, it makes Hoffman look like a metropolis, but <laughs> for some reason, Maine. Every little town in Maine had a meeting, and they all had ten or twelve people that used to go to it. Um, and sometimes they'd go from other towns. It's kind of like churches are down here. You'll see a church, and I was like, who goes to this church? But anyway, um, <laughs> I went to this meeting, and I, I was so far gone. I'd, you know, I'd been to a million meetings in New York. I don't know if they didn't read how it works, or um, I just wasn't paying enough attention. Guy gives me how it works. I'm sitting there, would you like to read how it works? I said, yeah, sure. And um, he gets up there, does his spiel, and then he says, I'm going to ask Brian to read how it works. I said, I read it already. <laughs> He's like, aloud, up here. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but I did. I stayed sober for about, I stayed dry for about three months. And during this period of time, I learned how to use AA as damage control. God forgive me, but that's what I did. I would get into, get into a jam, I'd go to AA, I'd save a bunch of money for a drunk. Uh, I'd be saying I'm saving it for a rainy day, but I didn't even believe, I never believed in that. Um, I mean, I spent money, rec when I was drinking, I spent money recklessly, I mean, I've owned a lot of vehicles in sobriety, but I mean, when I was drinking, I'd trade them in, sometimes I'd buy a truck and I wouldn't like it, I'd take it right back and, and buy another one, lose $10,000 and just laugh about it. 
Um, kind of wish I had that money now. But anyway, um, I, bouncing back and forth in AA, just using not really serious. And I met the guy who used to be my sponsor. His name is Charlie Johnson, and um, better sponsor you couldn't ask for. Is one of these guys who would just tell you the truth. Um, and he would always say, if I said I didn't want to do something, he would always, I would say, well, you're not going to be my sponsor anymore because I was a smart ass. And he'd say, no, he goes, you probably ain't going to stay sober. And, you know, before that, didn't mean, I remember him telling me one time in the car, it was like right before my last drunk, he's like, you've had enough drinking, son. And I, I, I deep down inside, I knew I didn't have enough drinking. I was going to myself, who the hell does he say who, how much drinking I've had? Um, I did get drunk again. My last drunk was two months, and I become something I never thought I'd become. I become pretty much not unemployable, but unwilling to quit drinking long enough to really work. And I mean, I'm a commercial fisherman. I'm a, I'm expected to show up twice a month. We go, we show up, we go out for 10, 12, 14 days, stay in for three or four, get drunk as hell, and go back do the same thing. And I couldn't even manage to make it to the boat most of the time on time. My nickname became, my last name's Carbonaro. My nickname became No Show Carbonaro. <laughs> because I wouldn't show up half the time. Um, I, I was, I mean, I was just, during this last drunk, I was just totally ballistic. I mean, just doing the craziest shit in the world. I mean, it, it's not even for, it was, it's fifth step shit. It's not for up at the podium. Um, anyway, my wife left again. This time with my, I had, I had a son during this time. I probably ought to add that in. He's 27 now. Um, Good, good. For some reason, a miracle. He's, he's nothing like his mother or father. I don't know who he takes after. Um, because his grandparents are crazy too. Well, on that side, my mother's a little crazy, but she's, she's not a drunk or nothing. Um, I'm a, she left, and they were gone for about ten days. I had a temper tantrum when they were left because she friggin' took the keys to my gun cabinet. And I wrecked everything in the house in a drunken friggin' rage. I mean, stereos, drums, I played the drums, drum sets. Um, I mean, just had TVs. I mean, woke up in the morning. It was the worst blackout I've ever had. I woke up, what the hell happened in my house? I actually goes to call the cops and say some crazy bastard friggin' come wreck my house while I was drunk. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, they know who the crazy bastard is over here. <laughs> And I swear, not two seconds after that, the phone rings, and it's my ex-wife, and I'm like, what do you want? She goes, your son wants to talk to you. And he's like, Daddy, please stop drinking. He said, I, I want to come home. Please stop. And you know something? Nine out of ten times, I probably would have just hung up. I'm not proud of that, but that's just the kind of man I was. Um, but some reason, I had a moment of clarity. I said, if you ain't going to do for Christ's sake, this boy deserves a better life than he's had. And I mean, I got to say, you eventually got to do it for yourself. But boy, when you're coming in, you grab a hold of everything. Do it for Jesus. Do it for your son. Do it for your daughter. Do it for anybody. Do it for your car. I mean, but do it. <laughs> um, and I said, I mean, at first I did it for my son and then maybe get save my marriage. My marriage was like a like a ship that just got too many torpedoes in it. There was no pumping it out and saving it. It was going to the bottom. Um, and it was 75%, I'd say, my fault. I'm not going to take all the blame for it. But anyway, that's neither here or there. Um, but I did do it. I did it for my son. And I did it for my, um, my dog kennel. Everybody who knows me well knows about the dog kennel. We ain't getting into specifics on that. Um, but for eight years with that damn dog kennel, Friggin', my life was un Chuck knows, my life was unmanageable. Um, there was some illegal gambling going on with it. If you could put two and two together, go ahead. Um, I, mean, I was doing crazy things early in sobriety. I mean, my sponsor found out I was growing weed and selling it. I, I was like, I was like, Charlie. I said I was making fifty, sixty, sometimes a hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm making eight dollars an hour now. I said, Something's got to fill in that gap. I got bills to pay. <laughs> He's like, you got to quit that. Like, I said, I said, are you going to stop being my sponsor? He goes, no, but I'll lose respect for you as a human being. And you know what? I feared, I mean, all, this is all sincerity. I feared losing his respect more than I feared being broke. 
Um, but I did do that. Last. He said, what are you going to do? Are you going to burn them? I said, no, I'm going to do the last harvest. I said, that's $30,000 worth of weed. Then. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> And he's like, he was always a practical kind of guy. He's like, wow, that's just worth that much? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, I got rid of That was the first craziness to go. And eight years into sobriety, um, pit bulls were ruining every friggin' relationship that I had. I mean, when you got 40, 50, 30 pit bulls, it's kind of... It kind of limits you to what women you could date, where you live, um, what you do, where you work, who you talk to. Um, so my life was unmanageable. It was. I mean, I love them dogs, and I love the thing that was going on with them. But, and I thought it was the end of the world when I had to give them up. And you know what? Six months later, I was like, man, I was, I'm some kind of glad that anchor's off my neck. I, you know, I all of a sudden started having a, maybe not a normal life, but better than it was. I started getting sober at that point, and you know what? This room here has always been special to me. I not only started getting sober here, but I started growing up. In Maine, I always knew a guy, or I knew somebody. My car was broke down, I knew somebody who could fix it. If I needed this, I knew somebody who could get that, this, that, and the other thing. He didn't know nobody. I mean, Chuck. Um, and Chuck could help you out, but he ain't gonna fix your car. <laughs> you know, um, so, I grew up. I started growing up, you know, started doing things on, for myself. Um, I remember spent a lot of time, you know, during them alcathons, and I'd be like, what kind of loser spends his Christmas Chris holidays at AA? You know? you know, and then life started happening, you know, getting in relationships, working a lot, and I was like, I kind of miss that stuff. You know, it, it's just funny how things just change. Um, it just... At 13 years, I started having dreams about my, my first wife and my stepdaughter, nonstop. And, at first, and I liked them, but I hated waking up. It was like, it was, and it was, instead, I'd be late so many times for work because I'd, hit, I'd, I'd throw the alarm clock across the room and want to go back to sleep and dream some more. And I don't know what it was, but... It was slowly but surely taking me down notch by notch. I don't know. If, I know I would have drank eventually, and it was at this podium where I really came clean with that. I mean, I always, I always admitted. Oh, I like. I guess I like being a freaking clown, but um, I omitted the tragic parts of my, the painful parts of my story to tell my father dying, that happening. Um, I mean, I, I love that woman and that little girl as much as any one human being could love somebody. Um, and then I went, you know, the whole thing, it felt good to talk about them, so I couldn't shut up about them. Sorry, everybody got sick of hearing about it. Um, you know, and then it's like, it's kind of had a reverse effect. It started causing me more pain, and I wasn't really living my life, living in the past. And I finally was able, a couple of years ago, just let go of it. I'm in another relationship now, and to be holding a torch for somebody that's no longer on this planet when you're in another relationship is not, is not right. Um, so it was either have to decide to live alone or just to let this thing go. Um, so I did. Um, it wasn't easy. I mean, I can say I never think about them, um, but I try not to. I don't dream about them anymore. That's somewhat of a relief. Um, those dreams are very painful to wake up. Um, My big part of my program that I'm working on now, I've, I've done all the steps to the best of my ability, and I work, I incorporated the ones into my life that, you know, a life things to the best of my ability. Um, <coughs> big thing I'm working on now is doing the next right thing. Um, I am known, if I see a pretty girl in a, in a, in a convenience store or somewhere, I am known to, to, to fuck, just want to buy something. I remember Chuck telling me about this girl at the Galaxy store that... <laughs> down there in Aberdeen, and I knew exactly what register was what she was working at without even seeing. There was like two old women working there with nobody online, and there was like 15 guys on her register <laughs> <laughs> buying all kinds of nonsense. And one little thing, I bought a sponge myself. <laughs> I was, back then I was obsessed with women. I mean, I just, like, when I was drinking, I didn't, if you asked me to go someplace, you going to be any booze there? And then when, in sobriety, I was like, somebody asked me, you know, where you, you want to go here? Has there been any chicks? Um, 
when I was younger, I was afraid that I'd never, I'd, I'd lose interest in women. Now I'm afraid I won't lose interest in them. Um, I guess, I mean, I guess it's a good thing as long as you, you, you could be in a relationship and, you know, and, and, and keep your word. That's a big part of my recovery. My father used to always say, he says, you don't, you ain't got your word, you ain't got nothing. You're not even a man. And that's the biggest thing. And I was a man of my word when I was drinking to some extent. I wouldn't give it very often, but... Um, and a lot of times it was in a negative thing. If I was going to get back at you, I was like, you could, you could trust that. You could take that one to the bank. And that's one of my biggest character defects is vindictiveness. Um, and, I, and I was reckless with it when I was drinking. I didn't care how bad, what kind of ruin I brought down on myself as long as I brought down some on you as well. Um, I really don't. I mean, I mean, so I think about getting back at people all the time, but I don't, I don't I can't think of the last time I really did anything vindictive. Um, I mean, I've been this. I mean, things. Are, this would be a life that I would think was so boring, till maybe about seven or eight years ago. You know, same job, same relationship, <coughs> same dog. Same, you know, I, the only thing's different. I, I actually have the same car now for seventeen months. This car set a record. <laughs> and just because the finance companies told me I was out of wiggle room. <laughs> but anyway, um, I really like that car too, boy. I don't know how a man, how a human being could get that attached to an inanimate object, but I am. That car is freaking, I mean, I put a dent in it a couple of months ago. I was just about crying. I, I was like, I like, we have a carport. I went into a post a little bit, and I was like, I hope I didn't scratch it. I get out there, and there's this big-ass dent. I was like, oh, my God. It wasn't as bad as it looked. It was only about $600 to fix it. But, and, you know, back in the day, that dent would have stayed there. Um, and I'm not talking about drinking. Either. I'm thinking of sobriety. I remember somebody rear-ended me years ago at the traffic circle, and I got money... She didn't want to do insurance. She said, I'll give you, I'll give you cash. I said, oh, hell yeah. And that truck stayed with the, you know, whatever. I had coat hangers on it and, the, you know, the, the light duct tape in place. And <laughs> obviously, I didn't use the 600 to fix it. Um, another part of my program that's real important is uh, when I'm wrong, promptly admitting it. And the trick to that I learned was eventually and promptly are not the two things, the same thing. The quicker you could, I know if you, if I know if I could admit I'm wrong, it keeps me from getting a resentment somehow. I it's really not even for the other person. Because um, I'm the type of person that if I do you wrong and you get mad at me, I'll have a resentment against you. I don't know if, I'm sure everybody, anyone could understand that. I mean, I've been like that all my life. Um, but anyway, um, and, and the biggest part of my program is prayer. Um, I could think of maybe very few times. The only time I'll forget to pray in the morning is like if, if I'm like on vacation or something, I get thrown out of my routine. And it's amazing. I mean, just the fact that I, I actually have routines now because I was seat of my pants guy all my life. Routine, uh, chaos was, more, was my style. Um, I had an interesting thing I shared it Tuesday. A um, guy at work that I don't like was broke down in front of me. And I tried to sneak by him because I don't like him. <laughs> I don't. I don't like him. I mean, uh, the, the person that's Brian, if he was drowning, I'd fl flip him a cinder block. But anyway, I got about 100 yards down the road, and I was like, ah, you got to do the next right thing. And I would like someday to be able to do it because I really feel like doing the next right thing and not because it's an, an obligation. But it, the fact that I'm doing it out of obligation is a start. And I did. I, I stopped. I Pushed his car to the side of the road and gave him a jump. You know, I was a hero for a day. Next day he was talking shit about me. Just like, <laughs> I was like, look at this son of a bitch here. <laughs> I was like, here I am. I was, next time, next time I, I see him broke down, he could, he could push his own Jeep. And you know, I was like, next time if that happens, you got You didn't do it, so he wouldn't. He'd be nice to you. You did it because it was the next right thing. Um, it's hard. It's hard to do the next right thing. It's a, I know from experience, it's much easier to do the next wrong thing. I, I mean, it used to baffle me. My, so, my sponsor used to say, hey Brian, how about trying to do the next right thing? I go, how do you know what the next right thing is? He's like, well, he goes, you're an adult. He goes, if it feels wrong, it might be. I remember one time I was trying to um, borrow um, $2,000 from him for a, 
little gambling adventure I had going on. And because um, he got a big settlement from work, he got hurt on the job, and I felt being his sponsee, I was definitely entitled to some of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him, I made up some crazy story that I was, in, I was in trouble with these loan sharks in Portland. And he smelled a rat and he said, I'll share my experience, strength, and hope, but I'll hang on to my cash. <laughs> and uh, you know something? I, I, I'm so glad he said that because I, I, I don't know if I could have stayed sober if I would have borrowed that money under Paul's pretense. And I came, about a month later, I came to him, I said, Charlie, you know, you know that money wasn't to get these loan sharks off my back. I made a bet that I couldn't cover. And um, he's like, yeah, I knew there was something going on. He goes, did you win? I said, yeah, I scraped up the money and I won. He said, damn, I wish I'd have loaned you the money now. <laughs> but he was a good guy. I mean, he still is a good guy. I talked to him once in a while. I have another sponsor. Charlie showed me, Charlie lost a beloved job and, a beloved, and his wife, who he, he really loved, in a matter of like two months. I don't know what the exact, he never would, he told me why he lost the job and it was for something stupid. He was doing something wrong, but it wasn't, I mean, they used to throw copper away. He worked for a big text, um, big uh, paper mill and they used to throw copper away and the guys who worked there used to take it out of the dumpster and, and bring it to the scrap yard. All of a sudden they said, you can't take, you can't pick the garbage no more. And he kept on picking it and he got caught. And he said, he goes, I own nothing, no one to blame but myself. He would never tell me why his wife broke up with him, and it's none of my, none of my business. Um, but I said, man, why the hell in God's name would I want to be sober that if, if that he had 10 years at the time, that if 10 years sober, this could happen to me? And he said, son, it rains on the just as well as the unjust. And he says, he goes, sober has, no, it has nothing to do with it. Whether you stay sober has nothing to do with your external, you know, it's that contingency on you know your spiritual condition I remember thinking boy when people say that I am screwed <laughs> if my sobriety is is contingent on my spiritual condition there ain't no way I'm ever gonna stay sober but I must have been doing something right because and the thing I was doing right was that I did believe in God I did believe he could help me and I did believe and he has I mean I know it almost my faith is almost I almost know there's a God to a moral certainty, because this room shows me there's a God. I mean, this is everybody who sits in here didn't have a drink today is a miracle. I mean, look at this guy here. <laughs> and me, I mean, I mean, it just, I mean, there's just no way in hell that, that I could have done this on my own. Um, I had something I wanted to say, I can't remember now. I hate that. Um, but this has been the worst, most worthwhile thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I had this other sponsor, Bob. He was more, more abstract. When I'd have come up with some crazy idea, he'd be say, there's a, be a heavy spiritual price to pay for that. I had no idea what he meant. And <laughs> what he meant is that you probably ain't going to be able to stay sober if you keep on living you know, an alcoholic life. It was basically how I take it now. I remember one time asking him, because he was divorced, and... Both sponsors told me if you, you, you're going through something, I was going through a divorce. I was thinking about leaving my wife, and I asked Charlie, and Charlie said, he goes, I'd give it another year. I said, why? He says, because at a year sober, you're crazier than anybody I've ever met drunk. <laughs> and um, I hated him for it at the time, but I did listen to him. And I remember he couldn't be my sponsor for a while for the things that were going on in his life. He just didn't feel spiritually fit to sponsor anybody at the time. I asked Bob, I said, how do you know it was time to leave your wife? He said, well, when I wanted to take a claw hammer and open up a head and shut off that thing that was making the talk, I said, can you add a little, something a little more subtle maybe? <laughs> and he said, he goes, how do you feel when you pull in the driveway and you see her car? I said, like doing a 360. And he said, it might be time to leave. And it was. Um, you know, and even though I really didn't have any feeling. It still was a painful process, I gotta say. Just, you know, sometimes coming home to somebody that don't give a shit is, is worse than coming home to nobody. Um, anyway, I'm alive, I'm sober. Um, I work a fairly good program. I'm not, some, day, some days doing the right, next right thing is an awful struggle. Um, I'll tell you that right now. I mean, 
I still could, my impulse control could still be a little better. Um, somebody door dinged my car a couple of months ago and things got real ugly when he, when he, he lipped off to me. And things got ugly because my mouth started going way before my brain was clutched in. Um, anyway, you know, I mean, just, I got a rat on myself too. Uh, this is the place to do it. Um, but I, I thank Chuck so much for asking me, and I congratulate him on his 24 years. It's been something else. Oh, that night we went, I got to just close with this. That, that night we went out New Year's Eve, he, he neglected to say we got, couldn't find any AA meeting, any AA dances that had even more than one woman there. It didn't have five guys hovering over her. So we went to the Long Branch in Raleigh, and the, and the bouncer said to Chuck, it's $20 cover. And Chuck goes, with a straight face, I don't know how he kept a straight face, he goes, are you going to guarantee sex? 